you can now stream Silverbird News 24 live on mobile app. All you need to do is to download Silverbird News 24 app from Google Play Store on your Android devices and App Store or on your Apple devices. Tap the live button at the bottom bar to watch us live 24-7. You can enjoy all our news programs including PJ News and Program. Silverbird News 24. The news never stops. What a 2023 general elections is already near and uh, we we'll, are uh, looking at how to address voter apathy. Now the national chairman of the Social Democratic Party, Shehu Gabam, is in the studio with us and recall that on Thursday he held the technological innovations introduced by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, headed by Professor Mahmoud Yakubu. At the press conference, Mr. Gabam said the present transformation embarked upon by INEC Hellsman was capable of giving Nigeria credible elections in 2023. He disclosed that the bimodal voter accreditation system had also eliminated malpractices in the process. Okay, so talking about um, a voter, you know, it is something that um, we've been it, the clamor for getting your PVC has been on for a very long time and now people have got their PVC but the issue now is what people would have to do with their PVC of course he hailed INEC and um, the leadership of the present leadership of INEC of being you know really upfront and um, you know getting everything on set but now we have youth and we have the the use of uh, poverty you know for example, now Asu is on strike. He also talked about court and governance. He talked about a lot of things that could nip all these things in the bud. And it just seems like sweeping and still putting the debt behind it. So it takes me to corrupt practices. Over time, there's been a clamor for capital punishment for corrupt officials. But, you know, it's always like a slippery fish. They catch them and they slip away. They catch them and their people are saying, oh, no, it's because it's not from Susu tribe or because it's Susu from Susu party. Do you canvass for capital punishment for politicians? Well, I don't know if there's a politician uh, alone. You see, in the presidential system of government, 80% of corruption resides within executive in the presidential system of government. 80% of corruption resides around executive. If you can cut corruption in the executive, Nigeria will be rated as almost corruption-free country. Virtually all processes of corruption, inflation of contract, stealing of public funds, all is within the range of executive because they are completely comprehensively in charge there's no warehouse anywhere where money is being kept for anybody to pick. Every money that has been looted goes through the system of executive. The civil servants are under executive. If somebody is appointed a minister today and you resume office, the kind of reception the, 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 the civil servant will give you, including money packages for your, your politicians or for your friends since you are just coming in, where do they got the money from? Somebody is being shortchanged. Some system is being shortchanged. Budget is being shortchanged. Now, you will find out that virtually all contract, if you look at the, 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 the kind of escalation surrounding contract awarding system, the billions that will be included just to satisfy a certain group of people, a contract that's supposed to be 1,000 Naira, will be given at 100,000 Naira. Where does it originate from? It's the executive. Who approves it? It's the executive. Now, the National Assembly have an oversight function. And then at that also, the National Assembly approve budget for every ministry, parastatus, or agencies. And they have an oversight responsibility to ensure what was budgeted for is being implemented. Now, in the absence of doing a comprehensive oversight function and ensure that budget is being implemented by the executive 
and at the end of the year, no money was returned. Yeah. How do you cop corruption? And who are those that are suddenly with responsibility of, of persecuting corruption? People that have been found wanting. It's the senior executive. Now, if the executive is fully immersed in terms of driving corruption, how do you fight corruption? It's not possible. Even if you said, okay, let it be a death sentence, who are those to prosecute it to a death sentence? They are the same executive. The entire security apparatus are under executive. So unless executive push itself, there's nobody can fight corruption. Nobody can fight corruption. That is the bitter truth about it. I've been in the executive before. I know what it is. Once a governor want to have a state that is devoid of all this malpractice, he will have it. Because the system is self-explanatory. And you cannot take away a dime from a government without being traced. It's not possible. Something must be tied to it. Some sort of memo must be tied to it. Whether justifiable or otherwise, there must be a documentary evidence that will tie to the taking away money from the government treasury. At the Ministry of Finance, Accountant General of the Federation, Auditor General of the Federation, that documents must be tied to it. The security vote itself is being appropriated by either the State Assembly or the National Assembly. You have to return how you spend it. Mm. Even though it's a free money, security vote for governors, for president, but under the transparency process, you must explain how it is. Security vote is not meant for buying arms or other things. Mm. It's mainly for intervention. That's why it's called security uh, votes. It's for intervention. If there's emergency water supply in Abuja, the presidency can use security votes to intervene because lack of water can breach the national security. So it's, it's, it's a cumulative thing that are, are put into one bulk of security votes. But largely what happens at the executive level, they use that security vote as their personal resources. And that is why you will hear a governor or a president say, my money, not the people's money. You say, I gave you my money, which belongs to the state and the citizens of the state, which is accountable for. So you cannot fight corruption. It's, not, it's beyond rhetoric. It's beyond easily going to the uh, media stations, uh, print media to say, no, I'm fighting corruption. Recently, what happened? Accountant General of the Federation caught with trillions stealing public funds. Are you telling me that the Central Bank of Governor is not aware the money is not being transmitted? Are you telling me the Auditor General of the Federation is not aware of it? Are you telling me the Minister of Finance is not aware of it? These are, these are sectors of accountability of the public funds. They are not aware that there was no remittances. They are not aware that NPC is not doing remittances. They are not aware at all. Then why are they in that position? Because that position is a clearly defined to give a clear picture of how accountability in terms of resources are taking place. Now, if there's absence of that, and people neglected it until it boomeranged, now the government is running helter skelter how to manage the issue. Yeah. The man was taken to prison. In less than one week, he was, he was on bail. Mm -hmm. And if the man would declassify how that money was shared, I don't know if it would be, and you can sit here comfortably. Mm -hmm. It will not be run over by youths mm -hmm. who are unemployed. We are graduating youth on quarterly basis in their hundreds. Parents sold their property to send them to school. The institutions that uh, is responsible for educating our children are on strike for months. Yet an individual has taken more than what is required to settle uh, uh, as an issue. Yet you, ha you have also a TED fund that was primarily established to take care of university issues. Yet, they have diverted it into contract outfits instead of taking care of ASU, uh, ASU uh, the initiators of TEDFON itself. Now it's a contract attractive center for anybody who wants to make a lot of money out of it. <laughs> so how do you define, how do you explain this as a nation? Why can't we admit that something is wrong? We are doing something that is wrong. What is the educational policy of the country? You have JAM that is returning uh, revenue virtually every year and the institutions are dying. Mm. 
I saw at the time the uh, I, Jam have generated the revenue of over one billion naira, and the system is going down. And what impact really is Jam adding to the educational system? If you have your Wayek exam, if you have your Neko exam, every university on earth will give you admission. But you will not get admission in Nigeria. You have to go yeah. through Jam. Yeah. You have to go through other processes. Why do we suffocate our own people? Why do we suffocate our citizens? Why do we suffocate our children? Some of the brilliant children of, uh, of the parents that cannot afford to send them to university are doing very well in their exams. But they can't go further because of jam. Why will, will we allow such a system to hunt us down, to stampede the country? My, 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 my children are schooling, they are reading medicine. And they, they, they got automatic admission by their WIAC result. So th this, these are issues that are very factual, that are palpable, that are touchable. But you don't have government that have a courage to say, look, stop this nonsense. At the point, jam determine who got into university. And our university system are autonomous. They have the right to decide the, how, how they take people into the university. The, 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 the quota system. So th these are very, it's a very big challenge that the nation is facing. And they are man-made. They are not natural disasters. They are man-made. We made it to look like natural disasters because of lack of leadership, failure of leadership, failure of responsibility, because there is no deterrence. And in the absence of deterrence, this lawlessness will continue. So now you've uh, outlisted or numbered factors responsible for poverty, uh, po uh, apathy, voter apathy, what would be your recommendation to see that it is effectively implemented? implemented? It's, it's very simple. Like the other, I mean, a while ago you mentioned what do we do to sensitize citizens to understand how critical it is to go and cast their votes. Yeah. I equally mentioned here that public holiday is being declared. Even if it's a state election, you declare public holiday. If it's a national election, you declare public holiday. Now, a lot of revenue will be lost along those lines. Yeah. Now, if the government and the private citizen will lose revenue, why don't we take it as a responsibility upon ourselves to educate our citizens, our youths, on the need to cast their vote and make sure that their, their vote counts? With the BIFA system, their vote will count this time around. Okay. They need to know this. They need to understand this. The era of tone printing, the era of snatching ballot boxes is useless. Mm. Now, since we agree that something is fundamentally wrong, and we are privileged to have someone who have remodeled the system into count, vote, vote counting, we have to capitalize on it as a nation, both as individuals, as corporate organizations, and let the citizens to understand their vote will count. That possibly will reduce drastically the voters' apathy. You know, again, if the country is able to bring sanity into this rascality, this, this recklessness of non-state actors challenging a state. Mm. And people will feel that I will go and cast my vote, nothing will happen to me, I will not be killed. That also would add value in reducing the voters' apathy okay. as well. And then the, the, how conducive the environments are, the polling units are, if they are attractive, people will come and queue for two, three, four, five hours to cast their votes. That also will reduce the voters' apathy. But you cannot explain in the states where you have two point something million registered voters and somebody who have gotten 100 and something vote being declared the governor of the state. Where do you drive legitimacy from? In the state where you have two point something million votes, and you end up being a governor with 100 and something vote, how do you claim legitimacy? How do you claim command of the state? How would you stop non-state actors from being charge of the state? We have seen in so many states, non-state actors will issue an order, people will comply, governor will issue an order, nobody will comply. Simply because there was no legitimacy. There was absence of legitimacy. Majority of the people of the state did not vote for the governor. But because of the processes that define how you declare somebody a winner, someone with, with, 
with, with about 100 votes will be a governor of a state that have 3 million populations. If you continue that way, how do you end insecurity? How do you end lack of legitimacy? How do you promote good governance? How do you make sure that a governor have a firm and grip control of the states? Yeah. These are fundamental issues, whether we like it or not, that is playing out, that is leading to voters' apathy. There must be something attractive. There must be a reward system. There must be a, a sense of protection for anybody who would leave his family, come and join the queue to cast his vote and for his vote to be counted. And to ensure that the person who has voted, he has value for it. All right, so moving away from this, Kaduna State Government recently talked about terrorists running a parallel uh, you know, party with the government. What, what's your take on this? Well, uh, Governor Nasr Arufai is very factual about it. Whether you like it or not, is one governor that speaks his mind and is an operational person. Mm. The kind of security breaches that happens in Nigeria is very scary. You begin to ask yourself whether we have security agencies or security personnel in the country. Because the reason why countries have security agencies is to serve as deterrence, is to take away extreme elements who don't believe in sanity, in decency, in normal life. Now, how do we explain a state like Kaduna where you have multiples of security agencies all over Kaduna states? And people will be on bike in their hundreds with AK-47 and wiped out a community. And the country have invested trillions in buying lethal weapons, intelligent gathering system, unmanned aircraft, sovereign aircraft. And you cannot be able to mop up this segment of criminal elements that are displaying AK-47, which is illegal. Nobody has the right to carry AK-47 unless you have the authority to carry it. But you see AK-47 virtually in black markets, being sold, being traded. And for no purpose apart from killing people. So how do you explain that? How many military institutions are in Kaduna states? From Kaduna, Zaria, Kano, you can count so many military security establishments that are fully armed. In recent, Zaria has been under perpetual attack by bandits. Yeah. You have, you have uh, so many military institutions there. Barracks being attacked. How do you explain this? And who is the commander-in-chief? Is the president. Okay, so would you say the president and the commander in chief is not doing enough to curb the issue of insecurity, taking into the fact that a lot of monies are being budgeted into fighting this? The law says, and he has sworn an oath by the provision of our constitution, Article 1, of every country on earth is the protection of life and property. That's the Article 1 of all countries of the world. Because in the absence of securing lives and property of citizens, any other thing is close to zero. Once there's no law and order, there will be no single investor that will come into your country. Even your domestic investor will not invest. Without law and order, you cannot have an enabling environment for economic activities to strive. Without law and order, you cannot have political environment that will conduct free and fair election. Without law and order, you cannot move to anywhere. So it's, by, it's, it's very critical, it's a cardinal uh, fundamental responsibility in stabilizing any country on earth. Now, with the number of crises we have seen, even of recent, with the correctional center in Koji being bombed, being disrupted, with the president convoy being attacked on its way, the, the, the viciousness, the audacity being displayed, and with the number of 
order the president have given to the service chiefs countless go ahead clear them off but perpetually you have seen a repetition of such barbaric act and excuse upon excuse from both the presidency again the national security advisor the service chiefs and you ask yourself was it that there was incapacitation and again you ask that look so many so much money has been sunk into purchase of first class weapons that have 100 percent precision accuracy that can pick anything on ground and analyze it and know whether it is an enemy target or it's a soft target the Tucano aircraft that have been so much talked about have a lot of condition attached to it. Nigerians are not aware of it. It have a base to operate. There are other base it cannot operate. When I had it of recent, I was shocked as well. And I was wondering why should we go into such an agreement? And why should I, why should the government go into such an agreement with a conviction that crisis will not snowball into another area? It's just that what we had, Boko Haram have moved from the northeast to virtually all the state of the federation. Banditry have no boundary right now. Kidnappers and, 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 and other criminal elements that are producing orphans every day, producing widows every day, are on rampage. People that are into cultists are on rampage. So, was it that we don't have intelligent agency? The answer is no. Was it that they are not brilliant, they are not brave? The answer is no. Nigerian security agencies are doing excellently well. They have capacity to nip virtually every situation. The board. But by implication and by political reasons, they need to be given a command to do it. What's your take on state policing finally? There are fears. The, fed the federal government have refused to swing into action because the feel that state actors will abuse that privilege given to them. Finally, what's your take on state police? Apart from the state actors, the state actors cannot pay salaries in their states. They cannot pay retirees that have served the country in their adulthood. There is no reward system. You can go to a state, a governor have not paid retirees for close to two, three years. You see them sleeping on the floor. Mm. What kind of heartless position is this? Now, if you create a state police for a state that cannot pay salary, how will they buy operational gadgets for the state police? Vehicles, security uh, gadgets, weapons, uniforms, so on and so forth. It's a lot of resources you have to sunk in. Now, for a state that cannot pay simple salary, how do they deal with that? The essence of creating police is to cop crime and criminality. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not just about giving them uniform. If it is just about uniform, you don't need, you don't need them. But what we say, look, government must be creative. Government must, must be a, a visionary about how to deal with these issues. Yeah. A country of about over 200 million people, what you need to do is to convert paramilitary institutions into combatants. Civil defense, combat them into full combatants. Road safety, full combatants. Immigration, full combatants. Custom, full combatants. Uh, NDLA, full combatants. Because in all civilized society, they are full combatant force. For instance, road safety. On the highway, they are, they are vulnerable to crime and criminality and being killed. If you do not arm them, they will keep on killing them. But if you arm them, you have great deterrence. And if you have a challenge, you have a manpower to deploy, to take care of the situation. All right. So including the airport security, you need to arm them because of emergency situation. Honorable Gabo, I'm so in the moving that's, that's it. Yes. Thank, Thank you very you. much for coming <laughs> on the you. show. We've been discussing or talking with uh, the National Chairman of the Social Democratic Party. Honorable Shehu Gabam, thank you very much. I will hope to have you My again. My great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's how much we can take on today's edition of the program News Hub Extra. We'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same station. Thank you for watching. It's bye from down.